All right, and we started recording. Okay. Anybody else who'd like to introduce themselves? Uh, hi, I'm Riaz. Uh, I'm a PostgreSQL DBA, and I'm just looking into uh, Python just to add more skills and work on it. Um, my favorite thing to do is playing cricket. Uh, that's about me. Thank you. All right. Good to meet you, Riaz. Thank you. Uh, is there a cricket style firework or? Uh, no. No, no worries. You're going to have to uh, teach us some cricket sometime. I don't think I've ever seen anybody in Utah play cricket, so. All right. And then is there anybody else? Going once. Going twice. Okay. So now this is a part of the meetup where we typically do uh, who's hiring and who's looking. So these are from uh, our previous meetup, but I'm leaving them up here because they are really good references. So PyCon was canceled this year, obviously, but we still, the uh, Python community still has a job board on here. And I actually noticed that they updated this a couple times, even in the last uh, three weeks. So. Yeah, and then I think Pokemon Company. Oh man, this is still here. This is great. So if anybody wants to work for the Pokemon Company, I mean, that was your shot right here. Um, we also have uh, Python Jobs HQ. This one's much more dynamic. Uh, and these are PyCoder Jobs. And is this still true for recursion pharmaceuticals? Does anybody know about, is anybody, any recursion folks here? Or I'll remove it if not. Okay, well, so that was the, from our last meetup. And then Mark Nielsen is probably not present yet. Yeah, he's not here today, so we'll remove that. And X plenty. Anybody know of any other uh, uh, places that are hiring for Python programmers, especially around the Valley? Yes, uh, that Autocon, so Autistic Python Programmers. Autocon.us. So that's Auti, so it's a mashup of autism and consulting. And that's what we do, we're consultants. Uh, of course, if you're a, uh, also, if you have other skills as well, uh, we do software engineering, quality, data science, data analysis, uh, and so on. So full software life cycle. All right. Thank you. I'm just checking this on a pause screen share before I like share a link that's randomly there, but it looks like there is a massive air table. Oh, I think I saw this posted. So yeah, this yeah, is good. Yeah. Yeah. This one, this one's good. And I think it's vetted. It looks like it's up to date ish. But it's a giant list of um, thousand, eight thousand companies, and their uh, current hiring status. No guarantee that they're Python jobs, but a job is a job these days. So, excellent. Yeah, this is good to know. Definitely, the Python Jobs HQ is a great resource. Another one, by the way, for uh, people who are in the know is the hacker news who's hiring who's looking uh, right. oh and actually this one is a consolidation of that so uh, there's a online forum called hacker news um, every month they have a thread called who's hiring and who's looking and that's actually how i got my current gig so i figured i'd stash that in there all right, anybody know of other resources that deserve a call out, especially for Utah? All right, going once, going twice. Okay, so if you are looking and you are currently on our chat right now, now's a good time to raise your hand and we'll give you the floor to kind of introduce yourself and uh, tell us what you're all about.
Ross Thompson. Um, yeah, so I, I already introduced myself, so you, I think you guys know a little bit about me. Um, I am currently looking for a job. I would say that I am um, I'm, I'm very new to the development world and programming, so forgive any ignorance here. Um, but I would say that I'm probably an entry-level programmer, maybe a mid-level. It's kind of hard to gauge, um, but I am open to jobs right now. And uh, when you have a chance, I would recommend that you put your contact details into the Etherpad. So yeah. anybody can edit this. I can this. definitely do that. Yeah, oh, perfect. Excellent. Yeah. Sorry, I should have been more clear with that. I'm off my cadence a bit today, so. No worries. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't even know <clears throat> that there was um, like a section of the, a segment of the meetings that was about hiring and you know, who's looking for jobs. See, so that's and really that's helpful. And that's on me for not posting the agenda before the meeting. I'm just like all my coworkers who keep dragging me into Zoom calls without agendas, so. That's okay. It's appreciated. All right. And is there anybody else who would like to uh, step up to the plate? Go ahead and market oh. yourself. I'll do a market. I apparently can't raise my hand as a co-host. I think that's a thing. Yes, that's true. <laughs> All right. Not crazy. All right. I'm Dylan Gregerson. I've been happily fun employed for the past few months. And, uh, but I do data science and Python and looking for a really good opportunity uh, to, to do that. And, and I've worked with several people here that could give you recommendations <laughs> for me. I'm not one of them. I'm just kidding. I'm definitely one of them. <laughs> yeah, Dylan has He's been, right. uh, <laughs> I think if we were to, to do a, uh, like a histogram of number of talks, I think Dylan's bar chart would be through the roof and everybody else's would be tiny little slippers. So yeah, mine's like that unemployment chart. It's just right at the end. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. <laughs> Too soon, right? Yep. Uh, one moment. Yeah. And then Dylan, you should, you, you know how to post your details in there? Just kidding. Yeah, I do. <laughs> All right. And then uh, you, I think you just raised your hand. I, yeah. Um, my name is Uqin, and I just introduced myself before. And and this is my portfolio. And I'm I'm currently I'm not graduate this year. I'm I'm expected to graduate in April 2021. So I'm looking for a job after graduation. So yeah, so this is why I'm here. And I'm familiar with machine learning and especially or for computer vision. Um, but not limited to the computer vision field. So I'm opening to uh, the data science also, and the front end design. Yeah. Excellent. And then let's see. All right. And hey, Ferris. Kevin, who's raising their hand. Oh, and Joshua, who's doing a thumbs yeah. up. Hey, so uh, yeah, my name is Josh Barrios. Uh, I am a PhD neuroscientist. I just finished my PhD up here at the U. I'm currently uh, working as postdoc, uh, but looking for jobs uh, in the machine learning space, uh, preferably in uh, something in computational biology, uh, in the biotech or pharma space. Uh, but as someone said earlier, a job is a job right now. Uh, and if I'm doing uh, coding and doing machine learning, uh, I'll be happy and developing those skills. So that's, uh, yeah, so that, that's what I'm looking to do in the near future. I'll, I'll throw my, uh, a link to my, my bio and my website in the doc. And uh, yeah, thanks for the time, Paris. Of course. And I actually, I know Invitae was looking for some bioinformaticists, so I'm going to send you, I'll post that in our jobs channel because I have a specific link for that. So that's great. Thank it you. should hopefully fast track things. Awesome. If, yeah, yeah, we'll see. Um, and let me unshare. So, uh, definitely, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll send you a link, Josh. Uh, let's see. Awesome. Thanks, Darren. Bioinformatics, right? Yeah. 
All right. And then it looks like, Kevin, you've had your hand raised for a bit. My apologies. Yeah. Can you hear me? Am I coming through here? You're kind of uh, muffled, to be honest. You're like, on uh, radio okay. terms, I'd say you're one by three. But now. Oh, that's much better. Okay. The, the, yeah, the microphone through the Bluetooth headphones doesn't work great. So I'm Kevin. I've uh, introduced myself previously. Uh, I'm a reformed attorney uh, turned entrepreneur and now looking to get into uh, the world of data science. Um, I am have a very, very basic Python skill set, so I understand that that's going to limit my opportunities. I'm probably looking more of, of a product manager job that's kind of in in the industry. Um, so yeah, if anyone's aware of something like that, that if I can lean on those legal skills, that would be great, but certainly don't need to. So Kevin, you're a, I'm going to put you down as a data science lawyer. If anybody watches the lock picking lawyer, then uh, you might get the reference, but perfect. Awesome. And when you have a chance, be sure to add your uh, contact details in here. Okay, will do. All right. Is there anybody else who'd like to uh, introduce themselves as somebody who's looking for a gig in the Python space? All right, going once, going twice. And before I say sold, Joshua, I just want to say that you have a really dope looking keyboard in the background. And... <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an electric organ I got from a thrift store for like 50 bucks. That was, that, oh, that's the best store. kind of purchase. The best great kind. Store, yeah. <laughs> All right. And yes, so we're sold on who's looking. And feel free to, if you, if you know people, we also now have a uh, jobs channel in Slack. So let me see. Do, 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 right here. So if you go to jobs, you can also post your, uh, oh, and here's Josh over here again. Um, feel free to post your details in here. All right, let's move on. Community News Utah, this is our Zoom for Meetup. So if you want to use this hosted Zoom, feel free to fill out a Google form. PyCon is canceled, which I keep saying it's a running joke, but we used to always talk about PyCon like, Hey, PyCon's coming up, PyCon's coming up. But here it is, it's actually online, which is kind of cool. You get to do all the cool stuff about uh, uh, that makes PyCon PyCon, but it's online. Um, and you can consider your meetup to be your uh, hallway track for those who catch that reference. And yeah, lots of talks. Um, yeah, and they keep updating them. That's cool. Stop using mocks, ooh, I wanna watch that. Excellent. Um, uh, Python 3.9, is it still in beta? I thought they got a release candidate up. Does anybody know offhand? Anybody want to Google? We're very formal here, right? Like I, I had everything prepared. Mm -hmm. Dylan? Yeah, it, uh, I don't know if they've had a release. Okay. Still in beta. Any other community news? Stuff that's... Uh, directly affecting the uh, tech community. I will say one is the uh, Earn Act. You can uh, look that up and, and make your own decision about whether or not you should uh, write your representative about this, but it might be something, especially for those in uh, who are responsible for keeping data private, this might be something that you wanna look into. Um, yeah, any other community news? should bring up as a community of Pythonistas. All right. Okay, so with that, Scott, are you ready to go? Uh, I think so. Awesome. Well, it's now or never time for Scott to take the plunge. He's going to give us a lightning talk about, uh, about uh, oh crap, what was it called? Data something. Oh, my apologies. Streamlit. That was it. Streamlit.io. Right. I had a look at this uh, earlier, like yesterday, as soon as you told me, oh, okay, it's all about this. And I started finally Googling it and I got the example running on my machine. It's really cool. So I won't spoil too much more. Scott, you want to take it from here? Sure. Um, so I'll just start off by introducing myself. Um, 
Hi, I'm Scott Cronin. I work for a company called Shop Runner. Uh, we're located in Chicago. Uh, I'm the only remote person on my team, uh, but I've been living out here for about a year and a half. Um, uh, I'm a machine learning engineer. Uh, I guess been in that field for maybe like five years now. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about uh, this little library called Streamlit, which came out, I think, about a year ago. And Streamlit is a visualization uh, library. You can basically start up a new web server. And the reason I really like it is because I can prototype and dev uh, websites very, very easily that are interactive without having to get into JavaScript, HTML, CSS, or use complicated, uh, I'd say complicated libraries for managing those things uh, for you. So Streamlit is a very simple app, a uh, simple library. Uh, and I think the comparison that seems most uh, uh, reasonable is R shiny from the R space. Um, I, I think I overdid myself on what I tried, what I'm going to try to present in 20 minutes. Um, so I'm just going to start uh, by showing a application that we're going to try to make. And then we're just going to walk through the steps to actually make it. I'll share my screen. Cool. All right. So this is a little website. Uh, and it's going to be uh, basically deploying an object detection algorithm and allowing a user to submit different photos and see what objects the model will identify. So again, I'm a machine learning engineer. I, I work with computer vision stuff pretty regularly. And I think uh, uh, I, I'm not sure how many people in the audience are familiar with some of the computer vision work. Uh, I don't think that's the point of this talk. Uh, it's really about how to build and deploy a visualization tool so users can better understand how some of your code works. All right, so this is the actual app we're going to build. Uh, I have a couple images that I downloaded from the Meetup site. Uh, so this was actually my first uh, SLC Python community event that I went to. Um, and there's a third image here. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're basically going to select an image. Uh, we're going to make a prediction on it. And so what a prediction is on one of these images is a bunch of labels and objects that the model found. Uh, we can be more confident. We can say, only show me the objects that have higher confidence than this threshold. So if I move it up, um, the algorithm will find fewer things. If I move it down, the algorithm will find more things in that image. And finally, we have, uh, we're going to select a certain label. So here's a knife. Uh, and this final visualization will highlight uh, in the image the actual knife itself. So you know, we can play around a little bit. So the spoons are being labeled up here. Uh, the dining table is most of this table. Uh, fork is highlighted right on this one little fork. Um, do it a bowl, found the little bowl in the corner. So in data, uh, in, in data science, we make these sort of models all the time. And often, our product people, our engineering people, they might not understand the intricacies of how our models work. Visualizations like this that you can just deploy uh, to a server and let them play with give them very good insight. Um, the convenient thing with Streamlit is it's super easy to build this sort of website and the entire thing is less than 100 lines of code. All right. Any, any questions on what we're trying to do before I get started? All right. This is the, the big risk is wiping this whole thing and hoping I can get back there. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is on GitHub, and I'll share with the SLC GitHub account so that the code is forked, uh, so that you can play with it on your own. 
Uh, I'm going to terminate the server. All right. So basically, uh, in this folder, I have a streamlet.py file that is totally empty. And from the terminal, I'll just start running the app. And so now I have a web server that's running based off of an empty file, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, I'll import Streamlit. Um, I've never really done a live coding thing before, so we'll see how this goes. Already uh, pretty skeptical. Uh, we can create a title. This is going to be the object detection, detection app. And when I hit save in my little app, I get this thing at the top and I can hit this always rerun. What that's going to do is it's just going to, every time I hit save, it's just going to update. So I get real time feedback as I develop this website, which is pretty remarkable. So I'm using a streamlet function called title uh, that is just putting this in the, in title formatting. Uh, I can do streamlet.header and we'll have like an about section about what we're doing. I save it and there it is. Uh, is everyone able to see my screen or the, the text? Is it big enough for everyone? Yep. Cool. So right there, like when I think about the getting up and running that quickly, not having to figure out how to start web servers, not figuring out how to interact with HTML, like I'm already way ahead of the game because I'm just coding now. Um, but there are there are lots of different ways to in, input text format. One of my favorites is Markdown. I'm just going to copy and paste some stuff in here. So this will be formatted as standard uh, format, like standard paragraph formatting. Here is a level three header, uh, and here's a little list of what we're actually going to do. As soon as I hit save, I just get this beautiful rendering without having to understand the UL tags in HTML, which is great. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to load some images, and then we're going to pick a dropdown to select one. With that, with that dropdown, select, uh, with that image selected, we're going to then pass it through a object detection algorithm. We're going to set a threshold to filter the objects that the model is recommending uh, to having a certain level of confidence. And then we're going to build that little tool at the end where we highlight certain uh, objects, highlight certain labels uh, in the original image and see what it's finding. All right, so I need to load in some files. Uh, so I'm going to create a little function uh, called load data. It's going to find all the file paths in the uh, app slash images folder. So that is this little folder here. There are three images in here that you saw before. Um, and so we're going to get those file paths. And then the, the images variable is going to open the image using uh, Im this image uh, library from the PIL library. So I can actually just maybe need to import it. I need to import this one too. So these are going to be actual Im images in RGB format uh, that will be loaded into memory. And finally, uh, the names will be a variable that's just the file name uh, for, for, each, uh, for each file. So we'll, we'll return back the names and images. And as soon as we hit save, uh, of course, we'll see how many times that happens. <laughs> Hopefully not too much. Uh, so oh, when we hit save, now we've loaded names and images into a global object. Um, so how do we know that it's loaded? Well, we can kind of do some development while we do this in real time. So if I uh, use streamlet.write, I'll actually write out in my uh, website what these things actually are. So my file names look like this. That seems to make sense. What are the actual images? Uh, these are PIL loaded images. And one additional thing that I want to mention is how Streamlit actually runs every time we hit save. So when I hit save, Streamlit will run every line in this file. And certain lines take a lot of time to load. So 
uh, in loading data, if we load every image, uh, that will take uh, not too long, but it will take some time. But when we actually start pushing them through a uh, uh, object detection model, that actually takes uh, multiple seconds to do. And we don't want to repeat the same things over and over. So Streamlit provides a really nice uh, decorator where we can actually cache the results. And so if we don't change anything in this function, uh, we don't need to rerun re re it. There, uh, I, I'd say like a third of the documentation on Streamlit is how to take advantage of these caching functions to make your app run really quickly. Um, so, all right, we're done with this section. I'll remove that so we don't need it. So now let's create a little, uh, let's create a little section to um, select an image from a dropdown. So we'll create a new little header here we'll, uh, where we can select an image. And to create a little dropdown, I'm going to use a select box. Uh, that's a built-in function in Streamlit. And I'm going to pass in the file names. And uh, the item that we select will actually get sent to this name variable. So as soon as I hit save, it is like instant. I got my three files here. Uh, all right, so how do I know, how do I confirm that the thing I'm actually clicking on is selected? Well, all we can do is we can just do a little another debug thing. We can just write the name of the thing that we've selected. So every time we change this, uh, you can see the file name is getting updated below. Pretty cool. Any questions on that? Does it rerun the file when you make the selection? The entire file, every line runs. Which is, I think has benefits and negatives. Uh, I think you can learn how to develop in Streamlit in a way where you take advantage of that uh, rather than it being negative. All right, so we have, well, every time we select one of these, um, we want to get the index that that file name is in the list. So it's a list of three items. Uh, I can get the index of the one that is selected by using the index method on names. Uh, and so let's just write that out, and verify it's working like we expect. So Dylan is the first image. Dylan, uh, sorry to use your uh, picture without uh, asking you first, but fine. it was online. <laughs> <laughs> it's public, right? Uh, and uh, so this another score A was the third item in the list, and so it's giving that index to as we expect. All right, so that means I can now use that index to to show the image to to uh, to uh, to uh, uh, grab the specific image that we've selected. So if I do streamlit.image, I can take the images list, index it with the index, and I'll use a little helper thing here so that I'm going to use the full column width of, uh, of the web page. So like I said, I'm not doing any CSS formatting. I'm not doing any JavaScripting. Uh, I am just getting a nice, really clean design without much work. And how many lines of code are we at right now? 36. Uh, most of it is text and imports. So hopefully that is as powerful to you as it is to me. Uh, okay, let's create a new section uh, where we actually start to take this image and send it through a uh, deep learning object detection algorithm. So I'm going to do something similar to what I did before where I'm going to build in uh, a I'm going to build a new function where we cache the results. And that's so we don't have to keep pumping the same image through uh, a deep learning model on a CPU, which is quite slow. So to the deep learning model I'm going to use is coming from the Torch Vision library. It's just the mask RCNN. And, and I'll probably need to import that. So we're going to set up our model in eval mode. We're going to uh, use some functions to transform a incoming PIL image into a tensor. And then we're going to pass that tensor through the model to get the prediction. So just sending the, uh, the, the 
image from the images list uh, through that predict function, we'll get a prediction. And something did not happen. Uh, and so now we get this little uh, uh, running thing here that says we are running it through a function. Uh, and like I said, it takes about two seconds or so to make a prediction on a CPU. Okay, so that ran. So if I press save again, uh, it's going to run the whole file. But since this predict function is cached, I don't actually have to run, run the image back through the model, which is great. Uh, okay, so now I'm wondering what is uh, pred that we've just assigned the prediction. So we can look at that. And so the prediction, we get some, uh, so again, we're predicting objects in this image. So we get some bounding boxes for where things are. We get some labels of what they are. We get some scores uh, signaling our confidence in that the label is correct. And we also get masks, which are the actual pixels correlating to that label. So what label, what are the labels uh, that this object detection model can recognize. Well, we're just using an off the shelf model directly built into Torch Vision. The labels themselves are all of these. So recognize sheep, umbrellas, snowboards, an apple. Uh, some pretty basic standard things. All right, so now we are gonna do a little bit of uh, formatting of, we're, we're gonna try to pull out the masks, scores, and labels from this prediction so that we can build an overlay that we can apply onto the original image. So the labels uh, that our model is detecting are gonna come from this, uh, from this uh, labels uh, key in the, in the prediction dictionary. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna loop through each of the labels uh, and find the index uh, in this label that that object is being classified as. So label names will just be, if, if, if we recognize 10 objects in this image, there'll be 10 different uh, of these names that reference the objects that we're finding. Uh, similarly, we'll grab the, the scores for those labels, as well as the pixels where that identify with that label. Am I, uh, am I losing you guys or am I, are we still together? Oh, Sugi's here, my coworker. <laughs> cool. So our, the next section uh, we will, uh, so, so we've made a bunch of object predictions and now we want to filter them to a subset uh, so that we are of a certain confidence that these are real. So we're gonna create a new section called defining a threshold. And what I wanna do is I just wanna be able to define a threshold value that uh, the confidence of each label is higher than, than, than what I am setting. So there's a nice little stream uh, uh, widget called a number input. And we, it's, it'll be called a prediction threshold. So the min value will be zero, the max value will be one, and we'll set a default of 0.5. We'll set that value to a uh, variable called threshold. And so now we can, get, we can change this threshold. We can go up, we can go down. Um, and now what we want to do is we want to use that threshold to reduce the objects that the model has returned to a set that is more confident than this threshold. Cool. So I'm going to do that. Uh, so I want to filter the object labels and the mass to be only ones where the score is more is higher than the threshold. And so we'll just run through all the different labels uh, and scores that we have. And if and we'll store the label name where the score is greater than the threshold. So these will be all the labels that have higher confidence than our threshold. And similarly, these will be all the masks that have uh, where the score is higher than our threshold. 
So let's actually see what our label names are being that are being uh, determined. So we'll just write the label names. And so in this image, uh, we are recognizing a person and a laptop. I wonder where the, those are. <laughs> uh, let's move the confidence up to a pretty high value. So still with extremely high confidence, we're recognizing a person and a laptop. What about a low confidence? So low confidence, we're recognizing a dining table, a cell phone, a bottle, and a suitcase. Anyone think where, a, uh, where this object detector might think there's a suitcase? Does it think the projector? water fountain thing? The water fountain, the projector, I guess we'll have to find out. Or the counter? Counter. All right. Uh, so finally, we have to have a way of selecting one of these labels and overlaying that result on our original image. So that's what we're going to do next. So we'll create a little section here called Visualize Results. Um, and I need to be able to select one of these labels that the model has identified. I need to be able to select one of those to overlay on the image. So to do that, we're going to use again a select box and we're going to pass in the label names that where the scores were higher than our threshold. So we're going to say that as a variable called mask name. And so now you can see we get all the different uh, labels. So we are in, in the suitcase one. Where did it? All right, there. All right, so we've selected it, but now we got to go identify the mask that's associated with that suitcase label and overlay it on the image. So I'm going to just throw in a little helper function to do that. Uh, so this is going to take in our masks and our labels that have been filtered to having scores higher than the threshold. And we're going to input the mask name. This is the one we are selecting here that's called suitcase. And so we are going to take, we're going to define a variable called selected mask. That's going to be the mask where the label name equals suitcase in this case. The label name equals our mask name. Uh, two lines of code to move it from torch uh, 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 tensors into NumPy, uh, NumPy image style, like NumPy arrays that uh, match the image uh, format. Just have two more lines, three more lines of code. All right, so our final mask will be uh, flattening the mask uh, to only that specific label. is not defined. Import it. Run it again. Okay. Drum roll. So our next thing is, all right, so we have a mask that we're going to overlay on the original image. Now we need to take the original image, also put it into the same NumPy format. So uh, our image again is this image's list indexed by the value that we've selected up above. Or just put that into a NumPy array. Um, we'll import that. And then finally, we need to do the overlay. So the overlay will be taking 50% of the base image plus 50% of the final mask. Uh, and that will give us a final image. And now we just need to view it. And aren't we super excited? We got through a demo of live coding. <laughs> <laughs> didn't fumble too much. Our suitcase oh, is our suitcase is Connect Four. Nice. <laughs> and these other games. Um, I think that happens at pretty low, at pretty low uh, thresholds. Um, it's actually pretty interesting. You learn a lot about how some of these object detection uh, uh, algorithms work. So here, uh, it turns out that Dylan is indeed a person. Uh, and his laptop is indeed a laptop. 
Uh, we, we did find the dining table, which is most of this area. Um, all right, so we basically have a big long app. Um, there's a little bit of stuff we can do to clean it up. Um, I, I don't think I need to write out some of all this debugging and troubleshooting stuff. So I'm gonna clean up that a little bit. So let's start maybe at the top. Um, so this predict on an image section, this was really just for troubleshooting. I don't need any of it. So I'm just gonna comment this out and comment out that right. So as soon as I save, that goes away. Uh, defining the threshold, I don't think I need this because all those labels are already in this visualization here. So let's get rid of that. Okay. So pretty good so far, but I don't know. I, I feel like I'm scrolling a lot and maybe that's not so ideal. So I'm actually gonna use a different way of, of setting these uh, selection boxes. I'm just gonna move them to the sidebar. I'm just gonna type dot sidebar before I hit the select box and it pulls this item out here. It's amazing. So uh, I'm gonna do that for the other ones too. I can find them. We we'll have the selecting a label, and we also need the threshold it needs to be in the sidebar too. And so now I have a little bit simpler of an app. I have a little explanation at the top, I have the image, and I have. Let me get rid of that defined threshold. Don't need that anymore. And uh, I can play around a little bit. So uh, let's see. So this was the soiree that I attended uh, a couple months back, back before COVID. Uh, and you can see uh, it's, this model is pretty incredible at detecting people. It's, uh, it was actually trained for detecting people. Uh, and they've slowly added in more and more objects over time. So maybe not so uh, surprising. So maybe there's a chair in here. Oops. So there's a chair, so we got that chair, this one, that one it looks like. Uh, what else can we find? We have a dining table, uh, a wine glass. So here are the wine glasses it's finding. Let's, let's go down a little bit. It's always pretty entertaining, I think, to look at what these things come up with. There's a bottle. Oh, there indeed is a bottle. Now let's go down a little more. Lots of stuff. Oh, there's a tie. There is, there's one person wearing a tie to the SLC soiree. Uh, looks like there's one person eating pizza. One person eating pizza. That's great. But that was an Indian restaurant, so that that's definitely not pizza. But we're at pretty pretty low prediction threshold. Um, so yeah, that's uh. So when I, when I build uh, computer vision models deploying a web server like this and allowing our product people and our engineers to play around with thresholds with different images it helps build a sense for how these models work and it takes a lot of pressure off us as data scientists to have to go out and convince someone that this thing is actually useful uh, these little anecdotal uh, websites I, I just find extremely valuable in um, relaying and communicating that message uh, on our behalf. So that is all I have. Hopefully that was a cool little intro to Streamlit. Scott, that was a really cool intro to Streamlit, actually. Um, thanks for using that imagery, too. It's really nostalgic, but also relevant. And it's good to know the robots don't know what pizza is yet, because we got to protect our pizza. A good A good amount of this was developed by one of my uh, co-workers uh, in our, we have an internship program that we've been developing and did a, a, a similar style uh, Streamlit intro uh, to this. So I, I wouldn't be without, uh, it's, I, I had a lot of help from my co-worker in building some of this. So. All right. Well, thank you so much, Scott. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think Joe, are you going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, please? Thanks again, Scott. I'm going to send you a clap emoji again. We can all just clap for him, too.
Oh yes, we can do actual clapping. That's still a thing. The emoji is so 2020 though. Yeah, that is. That's really, that's really sad clapping. Good job. Um, hey Noah, are you uh, are you there? I'm I'm here. You, you hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. So awesome. So we have a uh, heavy hitter in the uh, Python space uh, uh, talking about uh, some really cool stuff he's been working on. To so give a quick introduction about Noah Gift, he is a uh, is a thought leader, uh, an OG in the Python space. Um, best-selling author of, a, what is it, a Python for DevOps, right? So, and you're also a professor at, uh, where are you teaching these days? Um, Duke and Northwestern. Duke Northwestern, that's awesome. He is a content machine. This, uh, he's somebody I really look up to in this regard. He's, he's constantly um, uh, pushing out content, high quality content, and um, like I said, he's, he's, he's awesome. He's uh, we met a couple of years ago uh, through a mutual friend. Uh, came to find out we had a lot of mutual interests too. We, we both uh, do jujitsu and Boulder, so um, kind of felt like <laughs> we did a, like Bro a, broken hands, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like like long lost brothers. So uh, glad to finally have him uh, attend um, uh, SLC Python. And uh, with that, I'll let you kick it off, Noah. Yeah, thanks for the intro. Um, you, what I've I've been do, doing Python for about 20 years and the way I got started with Python was I was uh, do, playing ultimate Frisbee at lunch at Caltech in Pasadena. And it was this thing where people that played ultimate also did Python. So I, I kind of had to learn it where I felt um, like I would be not accepted. <laughs> so it was, it wasn't like there was anything even going on that was that big. This was 19. No, this was, uh, about 2000 or so. So it wasn't really even people even think it was like a real thing, you know, so it was like, it was like hacky sack or something. It was like, okay, Python, sure. I'll learn that. Um, and anyway, it's been an accident. It's helped me do a lot of stuff. And uh, I lived in the Bay Area for, for a while, lived in Atlanta, lived in New Zealand. Now I'm in um, Raleigh, North Carolina. And I teaching at Duke and a lot of the stuff I'm teaching at Duke is on cloud computing. And, and especially on uh, machine learning engineering, ML ops, um, data engineering. And, and, and so I think, yeah, like the stuff that was just shown actually is surprisingly topical with the kind of stuff I like to do as well. And uh, what, what I was gonna show today is uh, basically pretty, pretty hopefully basic, but useful in that uh, I was gonna demo how I work with AWS and it's and it's pretty much the same. I guess if I want to get really tricky, maybe just for fun, I'll do all three clouds at the same time and show you how I would work on setting up a project. Yeah, I think I could do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to have all three clouds open up like AWS, Google, Azure, although I know there's other clouds too, but the three ones that I use primarily and just how to, how I typically just scaffold things up and get, you know, my whole setup working. So that's what I'm gonna do. I will go ahead and share my screen here. And I do like to kind of mix it up a little bit and get a little bit crazy just to make things interesting. Uh, so I guess first step is I have this project that I'll share called PyTest that I'll just throw into chat here. And, uh, oh, whoops, I gotta throw this to everybody. There we go, everybody. And so let me just walk you through what I'm gonna set up. Uh, there's uh, a make file here. I typically add make files to things. Uh, and it's got um, an install section, a test section, a format section. In fact, uh, this that won't work on Python 3.5, but we'll we'll deal with that later. And a lint section, and it, and the reason I do this is that I'm lazy and I don't want to have to remember anything, and I just like to type make install, make lint, make test, uh, and it makes it simple too when I'm doing a continuous deployment and things like that. And then the other thing is that uh, I will usually use like a pytest type infrastructure where I have something really simple, uh, and uh, I like PyTest because it's function based. And then if we look at a hello world file here, like a really simple hello world, you can see there's some functions. 
uh, and uh, this is kind of the scaffolding that a lot of times I set up and also I've been attracted to GitHub Actions just through laziness as well, where the fact that it's built into GitHub Action, GitHub makes it convenient for me and I have a YAML file and I can just say make install, make lint, make test, make format. I can just chain a bunch of stuff together. So what I typically do, and, and I'm not sure how, much, how many of you played around with cloud nine, but I'm a huge fan of this cloud-based development environment. So I'm gonna spin up a cloud nine environment here from scratch. And what's awesome about this is that you can just basically create these willy nilly and, and you can just do stuff with it and then delete it later. And so I'll just call this uh, SLC and just uh, a temp spot to write code. And then from here, I usually would recommend the defaults are good enough for most things and, and we'll just keep it at the defaults. But a couple of things I'll point out is that if you go to other instance type here, you can do some heavy lifting. Like you can just say, hey, I'm gonna use this and get billed by the second on a metal machine that's got 96 scores, thanks. And that is actually, can come in very handy, but we'll just go with the micro for now. You also can toggle between Amazon Linux and also Ubuntu. And I think that um, if you're doing AWS, just unless you're just really, in my day, these are called sponsored by by Linux, and you know it inside and out, then sure, go you know go for Ubuntu. But I think you're going to have a better experience. And then this is the one that I think is just a killer. Two of the killer features here that are that are kind of subtle is that it auto times out after 30 minutes, so you really the common problems of AWS just go away in that, you know, someone calls you, hey, dinner time, uh, it, it like, you're not gonna get a bill two days later and it's like $600, you're like, whoops, because it auto times out, even in the case of the large instance. Also, because this thing has a, um, whatever role you're logged in is, like an admin role, for example, it, all the API keys and all that nonsense just goes away. So if you just want to write code very quickly, this, in my opinion, is an awesome environment to use and also to, so I'll just say create setup and also to demos with stuff as well. It's just like super awesome to demo. So while well, that's spinning up, uh, and I'll come back to this, let's go to GCP as well. And uh, we'll go to their cloud console, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with but I'll just click on console and I will go through here and um, say cloud shell, same kind of scenario. You say activate cloud shell and it just gives you a, a container that runs stuff that's probably helpful to you. And then simultaneous to that, also we're, we're gonna go through and um, set up a uh, Azure shell, so go to Azure, go here. And it, yeah, if you're into machine learning engineering, actually, uh, this is one of my secret projects. I'm working on a Azure machine learning nano degree this summer with Udacity and Microsoft. And what they got is some really awesome auto mail stuff, which I'm not gonna get into, but I'm gonna click on this cloud shell. And so we got the same thing. There, there we go. Um, Hopefully I can, I was w hoping that that wouldn't happen because I just ran out of some sponsorship thing that I was using that's probably gone now. And let's see if this works. Okay, bash. <clears throat> um, sure. If this doesn't work, I'll just punt. Yeah, I don't care. I'm just gonna punt on Azure. I, I, <clears throat> my, my, my free credits expired, so. We'll just use these two, but they, it works the same. So the, the main the main concept here is that why I like these cloud shells is that it, again, it's throwaway. It's got all the goodies with you know installed already, which Python, you know, which 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 Python three. Um, you can go through and start editing it. You can go through and you know Vim, Bash RC, start putting stuff inside of here, customizing it, all kinds of tricky stuff, um, and. And what I typically do, do though when I first start out is I will um, go through and actually maybe create a, a Git repo first. So let's let's go ahead and go to GitHub 
And I'll just recreate essentially what I was doing over there. So I'll go here and I'll create one. We'll call this um, cloud, cloud build or something like that. And then uh, I'll just initialize readme, make this Python, and then say create repo. And it'll give you access to this thing. There we go, cloud build, throw this in. Oh, there we go. And then from here, um, I usually try to just clone it instantly, which will not work. So we'll go here. Okay, it doesn't work. Great, I gotta create SSH keys, create SSH keys, SSH um, key gen, get that thing cooking. And then um, cat the uh, public key here. So go here, public key, cat this thing, throw it into GitHub so that GitHub knows about it. Settings, go to SSH and GPG keys, create a new key, SLC, throw that in there. It's gonna ask for my password. Great, so then once this thing's set up, then you know I got my first kind of you know, um, bi-directional hookup. And this is what's awesome is that that's really, once you do this, the things can be deleted and you just don't care. And, and so what I'm gonna do next here is um, I'm gonna CD into this environment and I'll just create a scaffold. So I, I typically do this, I'll say Python 3-n v e and v. And I, I typically call this the, the same name as my repo, again, for laziness. And then I create a little virtual environment in my home directory is invisibly. And then I do this, cloud build, bin activate, there we go. And then uh, I will say touch make file, touch requirements file. And then um, that's pretty much good to go. And then those will start to show up here. And one little trick here is that make files are not friendly with uh, spaces. So I change that. And then, because I, I do this so often, I, I typically just, again, super lazy, I'll just grab one of these that I created earlier. I'll just kind of throw it in there and just, you know, eyeball it. Is this good? Yeah, it looks pretty good. Save it. And then I'll also um, touch a uh, requirements file. Oh, and I already did that. Okay. And then, and then I can look here. I've got to put in, um, let's say, uh, PyLint is usually, I uh, have all black. Um, PyTest, and that's probably all I need. Maybe Click, I like, I, Click is almost like an essential tool for me now. And then I do my lazy stuff, I say make install. And the reason why I like this kind of initial setup is that it just saves me just a ton of time. Anytime I'm working on any project, it's just less stuff to remember. It's like, I just do make install, I do this stuff. And then, uh, what we can do is I can just say um, get add star and it's going to have to do all this get initial setup stuff like initial commit and I have to change it and I'm lazy I know there's a better way to do this but I'm just I just want to get past the noise and just do what it tells me to do so I go through here set this guy up again copy should probably make a script that does all this. It goes here, there we go. And then I'll amend it, fix this in my default editor. So we'll go through here, write this out. <clears throat> Exit, great, push this. Now that I pushed it, if I'm working on a project that's like multi-cloud, for example, um, then potentially what I would do is I would, um, same thing, look inside of here, say get clone, clone this, whoops, let's do, let's grab the right repo here, which is this one, let's go to this, copy it, and uh, get clone, there we go, and then uh, I can do the same thing, I can just be lazy, cd into this directory, and then say same thing python 3 dash n virtual environment tilde slash dot cloud build and then this thing's i forget why this thing gets angry that sure i'll, I'll do this we'll install this 
Noah? Yes. Since you have a dedicated machine here, why do you use um, the virtual environments for Python and not just install as root? Um, I just found that like, it, it just eliminates a lot of the nonsense that like for some reason, one of the problems, it's a good question. One of the problems that happens is um, that for some reason, uh, this is like the nature of, of like a Python based environment is that there's always something that's just irritating that's broken in a very subtle way. And I found that virtual environments just streamline it, even if they don't, they're not necessarily like needed. They're, they're, it, it's almost like, a, I would call it almost like a Russian roulette where like you're, you're like most of the time you're probably good, but, but what this, it, 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 I, I know I have a pretty, you know, re reproducible environment that's, that I, I kind of know the ins and outs of, of what will happen uh, inside of a uh, virtual environment. Um, and so, but, but yeah, to your point, probably in some cases, you know, especially with containers, eh, maybe it doesn't buy you anything, but it, it's just from a, a simplicity standpoint, it, it simplifies things. And in the case of this last one, so I'm going to, I'm just going to source this, for example, uh, one thing that, that also may happen is that I may actually be working on many projects at the same time. And so th that's when it definitely is helpful, right? So you can see, I've got a bunch of different projects on, on this, this machine. And in fact, one of the things I did that, you know, may or may not be suit your needs is just, I was showing some students, this is that, is that you also could on login, just source like a master virtual environment if you wanted to. Uh, and then, and then if you want to work on a different project, source another virtual environment. But yeah, just a long story short, I, I found it just simplifies some of the problems that typically come up. So now that I got this thing, right? And, and I go into this cloud build environment here uh, and I say, which Python uh, three, we can see it's in the right here. Now, now I can essentially do the exact same thing, right? And this is the other thing I like about this. I say, you know, make install. There we go, boom. And everything, everything works. I just know that if I clone a project that I've created, if I say make install, there will be no, you know, there'll be nothing that's a surprise. Then the next thing that I would do is, and we can kind of go toggle back and forth here is, is probably just get like a little scaffolding set up here. So we can, we can grab um, like a, like something just silly like this, like just some functions that do some stuff. And then I would go through here and just set up a scaffolding. And then inside the scaffolding, um, go paste this in. So you can see there's just some functions that return silly strings. Uh, and then uh, because we know that the linting is set up here, right? I mean, I guess I could be lazy and, and actually put a star or something, but let's just say make lint. We know that that works, right? And, and now if I check this in, as well, this is, this is, I think this kind of workflow is really good for um, multi-cloud setups, initial file, is that I go here, I go back to this, this thing here, and I could just say, get pull, make lint. There you go. And, 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 I, and I know like these are, these things are all um, compatible. And then the, the other piece would be, okay, now let's get our test file here working. So let's kind of throw a test file in here. Go here, go to test file, throw this, this in, and go to this and just say touch test hello, and throw this test code in here. And just a little couple things I'll point out about this is that if you're not familiar with, um, the um, PyLint is that, I'm sorry, PyTest is that you can do these these um, the, these test based uh, work workflows that are that are function sorry function based workflows where it's super simple and I don't know why that's complaining expected end of file while while parsing hmm, interesting 
I don't know what I've got there as a bug, but that's what I get for cutting and pasting. But let, let's see if this still works if I say make test or if that's a, well, whatever. Sometimes these cloud environments, they, they, they have like little teeny, like they're a little, they're a little buggy, but um, anyway, that appeared to work, the test work. And if, if we wanna see it fail, like I can, I can make a, a bad test. Like, so we know that that function basically adds one and this adds two. So I can just, um, you know, um, make this, there we go. And you see the assertion for failure. So in fact, what I, what I can do is just add this in. And there we go, just add this in and verify that the other environment, uh, adding in test, there we go. And in fact, what we can do is if I do a get pull here and I say make um, test, boom, everything is broken. And one thing I wanted to show you too is if you haven't played around with this is they also have their own, all these cloud providers are like competing with each other with these emerging cloud-based tools. They're not great, but they're, but they're, they're, they're okay. Uh, and there's some tricks in there that are, that are pretty cool. So if I go to the cloud build project, we can look at this test file here. And if I want to, I can just comment this out, right? We know that that's, that, that is, um, a test. Well, actually, that's that's not proper. I should, I should, I should just fix the test. There you go. We'll fix the test here, and let's look at. Let's just double check. That one says one. So if I if I have a setup here that's ten, yeah, it should be eleven. Okay, so that looks good. I can save it. Go back to the terminal. Go here. Make the test a pass. And then say git add. Commit this tests then we've got so we've got kind of a, a, a you know a, a dual cloud shell you know thing working here same thing make make test and then then the part that I think is is pretty awesome is again going to the github actions thing here is that we can go back to this project and just say hey let's start doing fancy stuff and there's just like a ton of stuff here that, that I've been getting into, like deploy things automatically, build packages, deploy them to the, by the package index, all kinds of stuff. But we'll, we'll just go to just make a new one. And uh, I, since again, I've, I've already got like a scaffolding here, I can just go to this, find this YAML file, go raw, and then copy this and paste, paste it in to this like that there we go start the commit you know initial tests like that commit this thing and then instantly this is why i i used to use circle ci but i think this one is in my opinion much better one i like uh, microsoft is definitely growing on me as a company for python and also this is a very simple workflow like this is trivial to 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 get this working there's nothing you have to do at all and it's already built into the environment uh, so I, I if if i definitely think circle ci could be in some trouble here just because of how good this is there we go i linted it you know i i even do some tricky stuff like format code automatically all kinds of so so this would just give me a hint like hey i need to maybe i need to run python black or whatever now that I got this working, I can go back to here, create a status badge, copy this markdown, go to my project, throw it inside of here, make a, make a little badge here. And now I got the whole workflow working. And then from here, now that I got all that set up or either environments, whatever one I wanna use, we'll just use this one, I can pull all that down. And then I could just kind of break it again. So I could go to hello here and just verify that var, that, that in fact, yes, linting doesn't work. This fails, so get status, um, get add hello, commit this. And we see adding bad lint and 
now if I go back to this environment, we should, things should blow up. And so in a nutshell, that's, that's kind of my, my, you know, workflow style that, that serves me pretty well for a lot of stuff. And what I found about this as well, especially for cloud-based development is that everything is now a YAML file. So if I want to use, um, let's say for example, um, do continuous deployment of a Google app engine app, or if I want to do, and you can see here, right? Lint, lint fails, right? And then I can, again, go back to here, get pull, go back to my editor, fix it, do all my fancy stuff here, comment it out, go to terminal. And, and, and so the, um, Yeah, anyway, the, 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 you, you get the, 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 the gist of it. So the other thing I like about this workflow is it's very like suitable to, to, to doing the cloudy kind of stuff. So, um, so basically, if I wanted to then later do something fancier, like do Google App Engine Auto Deploy or something, what I could do is I could go to code build here and the way code build um, or code, what is it? I thought it was called code build. Whatever. Um, I don't know why this thing's getting weird. Uh, cloud build. Cloud build, there we go, cloud build. And so cloud build um, has like a fairly trivial um, build process where you, if I go here, this is, I'll throw this to you. This is something I did with uh, somebody just recently, a student is you can see here that this style that I use, it, it also is like very kind of healthy, like it's friendly to this like microservice auto deployment stuff. And also there's, um, you know, if you're building like a Hugo, I think I have a Hugo site that I, Hugo deploy, here's an example where same thing, like this this whole style of like YAML files with, make commands and things like that. It just fits, it's kind of friendly and fits, fits well with, with, with this. And so, yeah, that's, that's the gist, that's the gist of it. And then I guess the other thing I'll show you, so that's pretty much the continuous integration stuff, but the, the part that, that you may or may not be aware of with cloud nine that I'll show you that's pretty awesome is, uh, yeah, maybe the quick question, who here has used cloud nine, anyone? Okay, so, so let me, let me show you so I showed you how it's, you can set it up super quick. Let, let me also show you a couple, one last thing. So the last thing I'll show you is that the, um, if we go to the AWS console here and I go to Lambda, which I'm assuming people probably have played around with, um, I'll show you my, my, the Lambda demo that I always do. So we'll go here, we'll just call this um, SLC, Marco, and then I will say runtime, maybe make this a little bit bigger. Runtime, uh, Python 3.6, and say create function. And one of the reasons why Lambda is probably my favorite tool in general with Python now is that you can, I can just think and just make stuff my, 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 my thoughts kind of go into to code here and I can build stuff very quickly. So I can, I can just go here and say, okay, let's, um, if uh, event name is equal to Marco, um, return back um, Polo. Uh, otherwise, uh, return the phrase no or something like that. And then if we want to, I can even add a little print statement that just tells me like, uh, this is my event, just so we, we can see what it is, right? So I can just prototype stuff out like super, super fast, save this thing. And then it has this like JSON editor. So I go in here and say configure test event, go in, call this like uh, Marco, go here, say name, Marco, this this one, format the JSON, create it, test it, 
There we go. You can see response is Polo. This is my event with Marco. And I can make now a different event that's like uh, Bob. We'll call this one Bob. And there we go. So Bob and format, great, test this. No, there you go, right? So, so this kind of stuff is like, is pretty awesome. And there's all kinds of like super magic stuff that you can do with, um, with this, like add triggers, like, you know, you can build microservices, talk to IOT, you know, Alexa, you know, all kinds of just things inside of your like uh, events, queues. Um, and I have all this other stuff that I do with this and other classes I teach, but the, the, the main, the main takeaway I think is that, is that this is just a kind of a general purpose, like, you just have some thought you put into here, you build all this stuff. And then here's how cloud nine comes in is that now I could go to this and go to this resource here and go find that, which I think it was like SLC Marco or something like that. Uh, where's that thing? What did I call it? SLC. Yeah. SLC. Let me refresh this. There we go. So you see this thing, I just right click on it, say import. And then what's cool about this is it like pulls it into cloud nine and then I got the same code. And then if I scroll up to this local functions here, just refresh it again. Now it shows up here. I can right click on it, say run, run local. And uh, I can just start playing around with it. So I can go here, just be like, uh, you know, name is Marco like that, run run this code. And I think the first time it like, okay, it, it sometimes it doesn't always work the first time, so you have to do it a couple times. If I change out, you know, Polo, right? So you can do just crazy stuff with this, this whole like back and forth. And I've like debugged like just massively nasty code using the thing I'm about to show you, which is you also can do this. You can say Lambda remote, do the same thing. And so we can just say like, um, you know, SLC was here like that, run it. And then if I go back to Lambda, I can go to my monitoring and go to view logs and CloudWatch logs. And then I can just find these events. Anytime you do a print in Lambda, you can see, there we go, there's my, so I can, I can remotely invoke this thing. So I could be like doing like, natural language processing, computer vision, calling, you know, ADBU a SageMaker, doing all kinds of stuff. And then I'm just inside of this cloud nine environment, just kind of cranking. And then I'm just calling into, um, in, into AWS. So, so yeah, th this is probably my favorite tool right now. One of my favorite tools is, is cloud nine just for th this, this reason. And, and it does, I mean, there's other stuff it does too. Like, you know, you've got like Docker's, you, you got Docker's already built in, right? Like you, there's all this other stuff you can do with it. I've mounted um, elastic file systems in here and all kinds of crazy stuff. But yeah, in general, if you haven't played around with this, hopefully this motivates you to um, get involved with Cloud9. So that's all I got. Awesome, thank you so much, Noah. Sure. Um, you know what? I have a question. Sure. How do you how do you manage secrets? Um, like if just, I have to store something that's going to call out to an external service, say I'm doing some sort of like API call thing. Yeah. The, so the what I've typically done for that is um, use uh, Terraform for for that and 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 use the whole Terraform secrets management um, inside of like a you know infrastructure as code project. Um, the other one that I've used on AWS is they have, um, Cognito, um, which depending on what it is you're doing is kind of interesting. Um, and you create like a user pool and then you can, uh, you can actually have some auth calls that, that use the Cognito system. But th those are probably the two main things that I use. And then in terms of, uh, a, um, uh, the thing I was just showing, GitHub Actions um, does have support for secrets as well by using the built-in um, 
uh, secrets component of here of, of this thing as well. So, the, anyway, hopefully that answers your question. So yeah, that's another reason why the um, if you're if you're talking about the secrets in terms of the um, GitHub Actions, it's pretty nice workflow to like if you're calling an API from the um, from GitHub Actions, like you're you're auto pushing code to some I don't know a Docker hub or something like that. It it, it work. I do have some stuff that that I do do use that I add the secret. And then I call that secret inside of my um, my GitHub Actions. That's really cool. Thanks. Sure. Do you know if uh, Cloud9 is available in GovCloud? I don't even know what that is. Oh, GovCloud. Oh, is... oh, 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 GovCloud. GovCloud. Yeah. Okay. That's a good. I don't know. That's a good. That's a good question. Would you mind okay. telling us what GovCloud is for people who don't know? Oh yeah, it's the government enabled um aws regions um you have to have a special account and they're often a little bit behind in terms of their offerings so every time i see something cool in the main aws thing i'm like that's awesome i hope it's in GovCloud because it's often the least common denominator if you're a shop that has to run an application in multiple for multiple kinds of customers, like government customers, banks, and normal customers. Oh, that's good to know. So. You know what? Um, I'm just curious, what is, how, how do you feel about Cloud9 within like a big tech, like organization? Like how, how would you see uh, adoption or people using it? Uh, I think it's a, uh, yeah, it's a great question. I would say it's a massive um, improvement in productivity, operations, and security. And the reason why is that the um, Cloud9 environment, you can associate them with uh, the IAM um, user. So the user has whatever roles they're aligned, you know, so basically, one of the real problems, I, you know, I've been VP of engineering, CTO role for a while. I don't do that anymore, but that was in earlier in my career. And th I mean, it's, this is like the most common thing ever is someone throws the API key into GitHub. <laughs> it's just like, it's just like the most th common thing that always happens. And it's just like, no, no matter what you tell people, they do this. Cloud9, effectively this goes away because you know i just you know am in here and i and i say you know for example you know pip install ipython um hopefully i'm in a yeah i'm in yeah so i go to i, I add a python import you know i go to ipython import about a three you know pip install about a three you could just start like playing out, playing around with code without having to manage all the keys, which is typically where everyone gets themselves into massive trouble, you know, comprehend or whatever you're, you're doing, Boto3, and just and just start writing, you know, calls to, 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 that, to that kind of, I think I even have, let me just show, I was just doing this earlier today, actually. So this is the, this is like an, yeah, if you want to see like a more complex, um, the cloud nine ish thing, uh, I'll just throw this into our chat as well here. Go to everyone. Yeah. So, so this is something I was demoing earlier today, but basically, um, if we just do this, for example, I can just, you know, um, where is it? Here we go. I, I, I can I can just start playing around with whatever API calls I need to make, and I don't have to manage all the all the keys, which again is just a massive um, attack vector and problem. The other thing that's nice about it is that um, it auto times out, so you've got um, you're 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 more closely 
uh, managing resources. Also, the whole like copying data back and forth is a very bad idea, right? Like, you, you know, you do machine learning. Um, how are you really going to be doing anything in machine learning on your laptop? Like, it's just, it's just not even possible. You have to use the cloud and you have to talk to the data lake and all this stuff. So that solves the problem. The other thing it solves is that um, you also can do pair programming. So if you go to here, collaborate, you can like join, at, invite people to this thing. You can say share and you can add these people in and you can, and I've again used this before, you can start pair programming on the same project. You just saw the other thing, you can remotely invoke. To me, it's like a no brainer, almost like how can anybody not use this? Like I would say it's that compelling of a, of a, of a um, product. I mean, it's not great in terms of all the editing. Like I like Visual Studio Code too, but if you're doing like cloud APIs and things, personally, I wouldn't even touch my local laptop anymore for um, things like, you know, Lambda APIs or, or things like that. It's just like now, <laughs> like it's just, it's just too, too painful. I can second that about Lambda. I remember a few years ago, we were helping somebody debug a uh, issue in Lambda and they were developing locally on like whatever editor they were using. And, you know, if you, um, if your environment's not consistent with the, uh, um, the, even the Linux box that Lambda's using, I mean, you're, you're opening yourself up to a world of hurt. The code night solves every one of those issues. Yeah, the, the, and that, exactly. So, and then that's the, also why the, I, I said use the default um, Amazon Linux, right, too, because then you also don't have the same thing of like, there's somebody that's running SUSE Linux and it's like, really, you know, and there's like some weird kernel and then it's always broken. And then this guy's like asking for help, like two hours a day. It's like, please just use the same environment that we're all using. I mean, I'm sure everyone's had that problem. Yeah, I'd say the biggest issues we see with Lambda have been just people using, uh, like developing in, um, I guess, uh, incompatible environments, right? Like, like so, SUS Linux or whatever, and it's like, well, what do you, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, I think that's a big, that's definitely um, a big one. And I think the other one that's really nice that I didn't even get into is that if you use a lot of like spot instances and SSH and that kind of stuff, this works really well for that. And that you can like SSH into like a cluster of spot instances, have your spot instances automatically mount to elastic file storage you know, do a bunch of stuff, play around, and then basically everything is like ephemeral, but it's still saved. That's what I like about Cloud9 plus Spot Instance plus EFS. It's like a, a massive distributed computing cluster that you can spin up, do a bunch of stuff, and then spin it back down. It's all like goes away. Uh, wh where is everything saved? Is there, is there some EBS volume in your... Yeah, so if you go to... Um, EC2 here, and you go to instances, you'll see this thing is just a regular EC2 instance. Um, and it's got a EBS storage attached to it. Um, and it also has, um, you know, security groups that you can change. So it's just, it's just like a regular instance that they, they manage. And I do do this a lot. I'll, I'll go in here and like change inbound rules and like, you know, uh, for example, you could SSH into this box or you could, you know, set up like local, lo, you know, port 8080 or, you know, mount, again, mount like other file systems and all kinds of stuff. Uh, Fitz has a question. Hey, Fitz, do you want to ask your question or do you want me to read it out? Fitz, hello. Um, yeah, you can just Fitz, okay, I'll just read it. Okay, great. Uh, Fitz asks, do you have any don't do X type of work on Y platform caveats or are AWS, GCP, and Azure pretty much feature compatible for what you do? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think the first choice for most of what I do is AWS. Uh, just, I've, especially for like, if I was working on building like an infrastructure for a company, it's just, you know, they, they, they have so many more features I think than than the other clouds. The Azure is definitely doing some big heavy lifting though. And I would say, you know, in terms of backend services, they're pretty good. And Python's pretty good. Machine learning engineering is pretty good. 
Um, so I would say AWS and Azure are pretty close for most things. The, the Google is like a more, you know, a mixed bag in that on one hand, the thing that I really like that I don't know if you've played, any people have played around with yet, but this is a, I teach an applied computer vision class. And one of the things that I use a lot is um, this AutoML workflow. And there's a, there's actually a little Easter egg in AutoML that I don't know if people are aware of, but basically if you go to um, AutoML, one of the little tricks is that your models that you create, let me go to this one. Um, where's my model? Auto mail vision. There you go. If I go to this model here and I go to test and use, that I can, where's it this one? Yeah, so, so if you've selected your model to be able to be downloaded, you actually can um, easily use TF Lite or CoreML or Coral, which is this thing, and, and you can actually like throw it onto like a, a, a chip or your phone. And, and this is a pretty awesome workflow here that they show you like that you can just download a, a um, like a, some, some starter code here that just, you click some buttons that auto trains a model, you download it, and then you put it into a, a, a mobile app that they wrote all the code for you. And so I think this kind of workflow, um, AWS doesn't have it and Azure have, doesn't have it. So like in terms of edge-based um, auto ML and computer vision, the Google's like knocking it off out of the, out of the park on. Um, but the other stuff is like, eh. like, I mean, I like Google App Engine, it's okay. But like, I, I think where they do their best work is on the kind of the really super geeky can, you know, like mad scientist stuff like this. Uh, on that note, I guess, where do you um, fit in uh, Cloud9 with uh, something like SageMaker? Yeah, it's it's an interesting, that's a good question too. Like I think Cloud9 is somewhat like orthogonal to SageMaker and that I would use this for building like backends and prototyping code and all that kind of stuff. And then SageMaker I think is better when you're you're doing like machine learning engineering or maybe like data science kind of stuff where you're you're you 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 know you want um you you want something that runs Jupyter Notebooks and there's something that I that I have that's kind of related to this question that's um, in a course that I teach which is called yeah this this here, I'll throw this into the chat so what I'm no noticing is that that this is, is starting to, to kind of become a thing, is that Jupyter first, was, well, for, I mean, first was IPython, right? You just, you would use interactive terminal, then they got money and made this whole Jupyter thing. And, and this was kind of where everyone was at, was they were doing like data science, visualization. And then now it turns out that if you look at Azure has a ML Studio preview, it's a basically this big auto ML, ML ops system. And it's, but it's Jupiter. So it's doing like the most complex, crazy stuff you could ever imagine, but it's actually just Jupyter Notebook. So you can like ML ops, ML training, ML deployment, all that kind of stuff, you're gonna have to use it. So, so I think if you're doing ML engineering, ML ops, that that's where the SageMaker comes in, that's where the Azure Machine Learning comes in. And then another one that I'll show that's in here that's kind of related to this is like that, what a lot of people don't realize about what's happening with SageMaker is like, this is what's happening it is that it's like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory <laughs> is that you, you just see this, but this is, this is what's happening. 
and and you don't want to be doing this yourself like this is not going to be a fun time like yeah good luck setting that up i mean it's basically you're the only way you're going to set that up is with something that just spawns all that and manages it for you Any other questions? All right. Let's give another round of applause for Noah Gift. Thank you so much yeah, for uh, so. attending our Salt Lake yeah. Python meetup and giving a great talk. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again. Nice, nice meeting everybody. I'll, I'll uh, give the, the floor back to you guys. All right. Uh, which, how do I do that? Why, why am I? So we, we get to spotlight you, so. Oh, okay. Now we all right. Yeah, so once again, let's give some uh, virtual claps, emoji style or normal style for Noah Gift. Thank you so much for joining our meetup. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I learned a lot. Um, actually, one question I had randomly that I was thinking about is that our team uses a cluster for uh really you know big uh big data any any heavy lifting and things like that and we're just sharing like you know linux user space for that would you see that cloud nine is kind of like the level up of that you know whereas we used to have on-prem uh kind of hosting maybe c9 is kind of a that kind of evolution um do you have any thoughts i, I, on I that? would yeah I, I would say i mean cloud nine is Definitely, like, so you mean like you guys have like a Linux box and it's yeah, we have a, a and cluster, you, yeah, a cluster, yeah. So, so I would say that the, this it's similar in a way to like a like a old school Solaris cluster or something, uh, and where you have um, you know NFS mount points and it's kind of got the style of that a little bit, and and it I think it works best if you have if you're already like sounds like you're you've, you're kind of like a linuxy type company i think that cloud nine plus elastic file system which we didn't get into plus um the uh um spot instances is a dream come true if you're super into linux so the reason why is that you can tell um the the spot instances to auto mount the elastic file system on boot. And so basically you don't need a cluster anymore. The cluster is just dormant and it wakes up whenever you want it. When it wakes up and it could be a thousand, it could be 10 instances, it could be like crazy machines that the, the data is stored in EFS, which is an auto-managed um, NFS mount point. And also when you want to sync data to the cluster, you can have a um, a Jenkins machine or some kind of other or co code build or something basically um, automatically uh, mount the elastic file system and just do an R sync. So you could do a sub sub one second deploy your Python code. And then nice. the spot instances, when they mount, they just source the virtual environment, which happens to be on the EFS and then everything's ready to go. So basically there's then also deployment just goes away. It's just non-existent and you have instantly have access to all your code. So if you're already like kind of Linuxy friendly that I think, and then from cloud nine, you could either mount it um, directly, the, the file system, or you could just SSH right into one of the machines, which has access to the EFS, which by indirectly has access to the entire other cluster because you can read and write data on the shared file system. Excellent. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of uh, little wins uh, as a lowly uh, backend janitor, I guess it's up to me to convince the team to try new things like this. So thank you so much. It's a great sure. intro to C9. Um, all right. So if in case people didn't see the message, uh, we're about to have our raffle. Before we get our into that, let's uh, take care of some business here. Our next meetup will be on August 5th. Um, I think we have a speaker nailed down but not quite yet. So feel free to message in the Slack. Uh, if you're interested, feel free to DM, reach me, reach out in the Slack or in meetup.com. And yeah, we can either get you scheduled. We, I can help you. Uh, I can 
coach you through, you know, what it's going to take to to present to our super aggressive group over here, but you know, our super formal group, we're none of those things. So this is a great spot. If you've never spoken uh, publicly before, Salt Lake City Python's a great forum to, to try that out. And yeah, um, let me see one thing. I'm going to share my uh, screen. One quick thing before you, uh, before uh, we forget about it. Noah, uh, what are some ways that people can find you and learn more about you? Perfect. Le yeah, there you go. Yeah, LinkedIn. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a Facebook guy. I'm trying to get an op-ed published in New York Times. I'll show you later about it. <laughs> not a fan. Perfect. <laughs> okay, talk to you guys later. So anyway, thanks, man. See ya. All right, so we got that. And yeah, can everybody see my screen okay? How many times are we going to hear that this year, huh, on a Zoom call? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Is your sound coming through? All right. Uh, let's see. So before we get into that, so next meetup will be August 5th. Um, and then if you have a talk idea, yeah, again, you can message one or you can pick one up here if you want to quickly learn something and then demonstrate what you learn in a quick lightning talk. That's also very much doable. These are some of the requests that we've had. This needs some updating, of course, but yeah, all of that's available. Um, one more time, just a reminder, you have to be in this meetup right here, this meetup 202708. You got to be in this channel on Slack. Yeah, it looks like people are joining because how this is going to work is all I do is I say who, and then this is how I'm going to build a list and we're going to do some Python to do the raffle. So what we got today to raffle again is once again a pipe portal. Um, and when you do win, we will send one of these to your house. Um, we are, the last batch has not shipped quite yet. There was a bit of a backlog on that, but these are these. This These are pretty awesome little devices. You can put a speaker on these. Um, what else do we got? Oh yeah, this one takes an SD card. So that's really cool. And it has built-in Wi-Fi. And the whole thing is coded with just Python. You literally will just copy and paste a file named code.py onto this thing and it'll start doing stuff, which in terms of hardware programming, I mean, it's a definitely a step up from FPGA if anybody's ever coded something like that, or even Arduino. I mean, Arduinos are great, but I mean, Python, right? Am I right? Anyway, I think I'm a bit of a Python fan. Not sure why. Uh, all right, so let's see. I'm clicking who. Oh, Ben, right under the wire. And I'm just going to do this. And you. And I'm going to copy all these users. And I have my Python console here. And this is pair programming, right? Everybody can see what I'm doing. So paste that. I don't know why that's taking forever. Did I not? R still running. Seriously, it's it's not that hard. Oh, for people who are new, I have been having random Python issues on this uh, setup lately. Let's see if this works. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Great opportunity to run on Cloud Nine. <laughs> right. I was I was actually thinking of spinning one up. But uh, yeah, so everybody, uh, anybody who's new to Python with this, uh, what we did is we just made a new variable and all it is is a string, right? So it's just one giant piece of text and, and there's no delimitation on this data at all. So what we do is we'll turn it into a list. And so we tell it, hey, if there's a comma, that's what we want to split on. So now we'll have Python Pythonistas, and look at that. It's a nice list of stuff. I am using PyCharm because I'm finding a lot, well, I was gonna say I'm finding success with running it on Windows, but it's trying to prove me wrong today. And as you can see, we got 18 people on the list. And what we'll do is we'll import random, and then we'll do two drawings. So random dot choice, and we'll say Pythonistas. 
Can I get a drum roll? Scott, do you want to do a drum roll? There we go. Drum roll. Ross Thompson. Please uh, send me a message on uh, Slack just to remind me and I will put it on my to-do list to send you a Pi portal. Next winner is Lazy Mutt. I think I know who Lazy Mutt is, but if you could raise your hand real quick, I remember. Wait, Dylan, are you Lazy Mutt? You're not Lazy Mutt. I'm Lazy Mutt. That was a clap. That was a clappy. Oh, that's Todd. Oh, yeah, it is Todd. Todd. Hey, Todd. Hey. Congrats. Hey. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. And yeah, with that, I have uh, not much else other than to say I can't wait to see all of you in person. Um, you know, they're, I'm fond for, for these days in the future. We're playing it by ear. We kind of made a board decision today. So next meetup will definitely be remote. And uh, we're going to play this whole situation by ear. But take care of yourselves. And if anybody needs like to talk or to vent, or if you're looking for a job, every single person on this Slack is a wholesome, awesome person. And they all want to help you out. But if you want to specifically reach out to me on Slack, feel free. My door is always open to a fellow Pythonista. So I'm going to actually hand over the hosting to Dylan over here because it's my kid's bedtime and I'm going to put him to bed, but feel free to use this zoom to uh, hang out. That's just a, it's a nice friendly place. And uh, until next time, I'll see you all on August 5th. Have a lovely evening. All right. See you, Ferris. Thank you again. Bye, Ferris. Bye. Take care. All right. See you. How's everybody doing? Pretty good. How about yourself, Joe? Oh, great. Thanks. <laughs> I went over to the front climbing gym, the new one. Oh, which one? The new one. Nice. Yeah, the new one again today. Cool. Yep. What's that?